All right, we're going to, in this service, we're going to look at Luke chapter 16. On one, of the, one side of the handout that I gave you, you'll have a message on Luke 15 and one on Luke 16. And we're not going to skip Luke 15. We're just going to do that one in the next hour. That way we can, that'll bring to a close that study on the prodigal son there in Luke chapter 15. But meanwhile, let's go forward, if we may, to Luke 16, verses 1 to 13. And we want to look at four principles of godly stewardship. Four principles of godly stewardship. Now I can imagine if you are like probably any other human being on the face of the earth, you have played that mental game, what would I do if I won a million dollars? Or what would I do if I was given $10 million? Or you see these people winning sweepstakes and some winning the lottery and hundreds of millions of dollars. And, and you sit there and you daydream, oh, if I had a million dollars, I would. And you start filling in that blank, don't you? What would be our first answer this morning? If you could just stop and think, if I had the million dollars, what would be the first thing I'd do with it? To some of us, we probably say, I'm going to hide it because all of a sudden I'm going to have friends and family and all this stuff coming out of the woodwork I never even knew existed. But what would we do? You see, there's something that comes to our lives, especially as born-again believers. And it's the term stewardship. We're going to look at that this morning here in this passage. How does a born-again believer look at those things that God entrusts to him here on this earth. Even, as we're going to see here, the unrighteous mammon. That means the unrighteous riches or possessions. That means those things that are temporal, not eternal. The Bible speaks to that. Someone said, as I was reading this week, they said that Jesus shared about 40 parables during his ministry on earth. And of those 40, about one in three are about money. That tells you where man, some of man's problem is, doesn't it? It's in a matter of our attitude towards money, our love of money, our misuse of money, or the proper use and uh, stewardship of that. And so you say, well, you know, sometimes you, you're going to talk about money or tithing or something like that, and that's the day visitors show up and they say, yeah, I went to that church, all they talk about is money. They heard one message, but that's all we talked about was money, and that's, but the Lord has something to say about it, and when he speaks about it, we don't shy away from it. We don't ignore it. And this is a, it is a difficult parable. It is a, an unusual parable. As you read it, you read it twice, you say, well, surely that's not what he meant to say. Now, this is the Lord Jesus. A parable is a fictitious story used to illustrate an eternal truth. He made up these parables, and it's clear because it's very general, no specifics, no names, no descriptions, just the story with the essential elements to teach us what he wants to teach us right after it. So as we're going to look at this, I want us to see four principles for godly stewardship this morning. And to introduce that, look at there on the handout, I have 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2. The Apostle Paul says this, Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Now that is, the that, that is a summary of what Jesus is going to teach his disciples here in Luke chapter 16, verses 1 to 13. Read with me, if you will, the 13 verses, then we'll come back and we're going to look at this parable carefully, and then we're going to try to draw from it what Jesus is teaching his disciples. Luke 16, 1 says, And he said also unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man which, which had a steward, and he, he, the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest no longer steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig to beg. I am ashamed. I am resolved what to do. I know what to do. That when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of the Lord's debtors unto him, 
and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, An hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then said he to another, And how much owest thou? And he said, An hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and write fourscore, or eighty. And the Lord commended the unjust steward. Because he had done wisely, for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. He that is faithful in, the, in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteousness, unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. I wanted you to see this as, as presumably he shared it with his disciples, just the full length with the parable and then, of course, the principles that followed. But as I put here in our proposition, faithfully exercise your stewardship for God. Whatever God has put in our hands, that is a stewardship. The word stewardship is the word oikonomia. That's the same word for dispensation. We talk about the seven dispensations and the way God dealt with man during distinct periods of time. In the Garden of Eden, before the fall, he dealt with man one way. And then during the time of conscience from the fall until the flood, he dealt with man another way. Then after that, human government, he dealt with them another way. Then under the promise, another way. Under the law, another way. And in grace, he is dealing with us a different way. So there are distinct times in which God dealt, and we call those stewardships or administrations. God gave us a stewardship that we were to be faithful in, and in each case we have seen man fail. And then God brings judgment. He then gives another stewardship. And we know that by the end of time there will be at least seven. And so we, we will see this carried out through that time. But when we talk about stewardship, that's what it means. Oikonomia is oikos, that's house. Nomos, that's law, the law of the house or the, the administration, the management of a household is what the term means. So as we look at the parable here, let's note who's the audience, verse 1. Remember the audiences, chapter 14, he went to the home of the chief of the Pharisees. And there he had Pharisees and scribes and the religious leaders. As he was having lunch with them, he spoke of the four different meals. So that was a religious lost crowd. And then he was out and he saw all these people following him and he stopped them all and told them of the high cost of discipleship. You want to follow me? There's a high cost. You must be willing to forsake everything to follow me. And then chapter 15, after he says this, then drew near him the publicans and sinners to hear him. You think they'd be the ones, hey, I'm done with this. Let me go back. But no, they came closer to hear more. And the Pharisees and scribes, verse 2 of chapter 15, they sat off murmuring that he received sinners and eats with them. So these are the audiences. But this seems to lead right into it from that. But it's, he's not directing this at the publicans and sinners. He's not directing it at the Pharisees. He's directing this at his disciples, at his followers, okay? So make sure we understand that. This is talking about... Faithfulness in our stewardship, in our life and ministry for Christ, wherever he has placed us. But to do that, he gives us a very unusual parable. And the more I look at this, and every time I read it, I say, you know, this just sounds so wrong. And, and you, I think you'll see what I'm saying here in a moment. Let's walk our way through it for a moment. There in verse 1, it says, there's a certain rich man. Now, this was a rich man. He obviously had quite a bit of uh, land just based on what his debtors owed him and the fact that he could afford to have a steward. This was a paid servant. This is not a slave. 
This is a paid servant that he has hired to manage his, his estate, his, his farms, his produce, all those things. And it says here that he had this steward, and the steward there is the word oikonomos. That's the word steward. Stewardship is oikonomia in the Greek. So this, the, he's one who's there to manage the affairs of his Lord. And the same was accused. The word accused there is an interesting word too. It's the word diabolo. Diabolo. And that's the word from which we also get diabolos, which is devil. Who is the devil? He is the one who accuses the believer and not in a good sense. It's always in the sense of detrimental or putting them down. So it says, this man was accused unto the Lord that he had wasted his goods. Hey, you've got your manager, your manager there, but he's squandering your belongings. He is embezzling your belongings. He's not managing your household well. So the Lord calls him to him and says to him, how, is it, how can I hear this of you? I've trusted you. How in the world could you do this? So you give an account of your... In other words, you, re, you give me your reports. I need to know what's going on. And then you're fired. You can no longer steward for me. Now that's a strong statement. It's also not very good business management according to some. They say that no, whenever you are going to fire someone for a cause... You do it immediately. You don't give them that notice that, okay, you get your things in order. You get your office in order before you leave. No, they say, you go out in some cases, if there's been malfeasance, they say, we will bring your stuff to you. You don't even step foot back in the building. But here this Lord, he said, no, you, you get your report together. Give me an assessment of what's going on, and then you're done. Which is strange. Then the steward said within himself, now we know Jesus later refers to him as the unjust steward. There's no question where his heart is. There's no question that he is not a good manager. He does not have a sincere heart. And this is exposed in verse 3. The steward said within himself, what shall I do? Hmm. For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. Now this is a pretty nice job. It's not heavy work. It's not out there digging in the dirt. In fact, he says, you know what? I, I, can't, I cannot dig. I, I'm not used to that type of labor. That's hard labor. That's hard work. I can't do that. What am I going to do for a living? He says, to beg, I'm ashamed. I'm not going to sit out there and beg people to give me money. He's proud. So what am I going to do? And see, this is often how the world sees their stewardship of things. It's not what is best for my Lord or for the one to, for whom I work. It's how do I get ahead? How can I, in, in, the, in the corporate world in America, it's, it's the idea, who can I step on to get ahead of them? Doesn't matter what I have to do to get there as long as I get up to the top and I promote myself and I succeed. And that is the mentality of the worldly steward. And this is, obviously, this is his mentality. So what does he do? In fact, he says, aha. The word resolve there is a word to know, ginosko. For, ah, I know what to do. It's one of those aha moments. When you're thinking about something, how do I resolve this? And, ah, the light bulb goes on. That's, that's what this is. I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me in their, in their houses. Okay, question. Who is they? Who's going to receive him into their houses? Well, the next verse tells us, so he called every one of his Lord's debtors. These are the ones who were indebted to him. They had bought olive oil, and they had not yet paid for it, so they owed money to the Lord. And they had bought wheat, and they had not yet paid for it. So they were in debt to him. So he calls these debtors all in. And he says this, how much do you owe my Lord? And that first one there, notice what he says. He, he says, well, I owe him 100 measures of oil. That's olive oil. And 100 measures of oil, they say by the measure of that day to comparison to gallons today, that would be about 875 gallons. 875 gallons of olive oil. That's a lot of olive oil. There in the conference center in Ajloon, Jordan, 
There are hundreds of olive trees around the campus. And during that season, you'll see the blanket spread out under it, and they'll get up there and shake the tree and try to shake all the olives that are ripe down to fall on that tarp. Then they'll gather them together, take them down to a press just a few miles away, and they'll run it through the press. What they do is they slice, put two slices in the olives and press them to get the oil out. And then they return the olives to the conference center. They'll put it in the preserves, and they'll serve it in the meals throughout the year. But the oil, they get half of the oil, and then the other, as payment, they get the other half. And they sell it for profit. 875 gallons is a lot of oil. In fact, it is worth approximately 1,000 denarii, which that, if you count the Sabbath days and all that, it's almost three years worth of wages. Three years of one day's wage. That is a lot of money. That is a lot of debt to, to owe to someone. And notice what he, the, the unjust steward does. He said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly. Hurry up before the Lord comes. I don't have this window of time for long. I've been fired. And you only, this is a one-time offer. You sit down and write me a check for 500 you, you sit down and you, well, for 500 uh, denarii or for 50 measures of oil. Wow, you just gave them a 50% discount. You just gave them a year and a half worth of wages. Now, why did you do that? Well, because in the, as we looked at back, Jesus confronted that chief of the Pharisees when he had that meal in the home. He confronted the ones who were guests and said, why did you go for the highest seat when you should have sat at the lowest seat? And then he tells the host, he said, why do you just invite the ones that can invite you back and that can do something for you? Why don't you invite the ones that could never do anything in return to you? Then your reward will be in heaven. But you do it. And see, that's the culture. You do for someone so that they will in turn do for you. And that's what he said. Ah, I know what to do so that they, these debtors, will receive me into their homes whenever, whenever I have need. I'm going to give them a deal they can't refuse and something that they will need to pay back to me. So he takes his Lord's money, which he has already embezzled and mismanaged, and he embezzles more. He gives this guy, and once he receives the payment in his position, that debt is settled. So he did dishon he, he dealt dishonestly with his Lord. He dealt presumptuously with these debtors. And then there's a second when he says unto the other, he said, How much owest thou? Verse 7. And he said, In hundred measures of wheat. Now, hundred measures of wheat is near a thousand bushels. And he says, Write me a score, write me a, if the idea is write a check or pay, write the bill for 80. They say, why did he do half for the first one and only a 20% discount for this one? It's the same amount of money. 500 denarii. 500 days wages, about a year and a half of days wages. So he gave them the same discount, but this one owed more. He said, write me a check. You pay me for 80 and your bill is settled. Now, I don't know about you. You can see why when a boss tells somebody you're fired, that means you're done, you're done now. Not a two weeks' notice. Go on. Because they can do malfeasance. They can do things that will damage your company, damage you, damage your reputation during those days. I've been, we have some friends that have managed some of the branches of the banks where we have banked over the past few years. And as the banks were bought out and the new people came in, they, they have kind of a cold, harsh way of letting you know that you're laid off. They come in, your computer, you're, you no longer can log into your, to the network. Your password's been changed. And you don't have access to your files, and you don't have access, and they say, okay, we don't need you anymore. That day, you're done. You came in thinking I had a job today, and you don't. Go home. That's kind of harsh, but the reason they do it is because if we let him have two weeks, they will take their contacts and their customers and they'll start transferring their customers with them to wherever they go next. 
Well, this is, this is the parable. And the worst part of the parable that is hard to understand is verse 8, as far as humanly speaking. Look at verse 8. And the Lord commended the unjust steward. Now, just the term unjust steward brings question into the idea of commending him for anything, right? How do you commend an unjust steward? That's hard, that's hard to wrap my brain around. But he did. See, remember this is a parable, and it's for a purpose. It's to teach an eternal truth. And he's speaking to his disciples. He wants to teach them about stewardship. And this verse, he commended the unjust steward. Look at this. Because he had done wisely. He, 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 had, he was shrewd, business-wise, for his own means, for his own protection, and for his own advancement, he has done these things. But then he says the following. For the children of this world in, are in their age, or their generation, wiser than the children of life. The world is more shrewd in this day and age, in this world, more than born-again believers. Now, all of a sudden, if you're a born-again believer, you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, and the Lord is telling you this parable, are you just a little bit confused? I know I was. I know I had to stop thinking, okay, Lord, did you really mean to say that, that way? And I, I, as I read commentaries, I, I, you see certain uh, commentaries trying to explain that away, how, well, what he really meant was, no, that's what he said. And he chose his words carefully. So we have to take it for what it says here. He commended, but observe the passage cautiously, as we learn in biblical interpretation on Wednesday nights. So for the children of this world, those are the lost, okay? But notice the next qualifier are in their generation. In this world, in this time, in this day and age, they are wiser than the children of light. They know how things work in this world more so than the children of light because children of light walk by the principles of the word of God, which are to deal honestly and uprightly with their Lord. So he's comparing, he's contrasting the stewardship of a worldly person, of the world around us, with the stewardship that God expects of his children. So understand, this very strange parable is to contrast those two things. What the world's mentality is, and we can look at the world around us today, and we can see exactly what's going on. I saw somebody, Josh showed me something this week. He said, it's, it's someone asking a question. Which is the most violent sport in America? In other words, the more participants are either indicted, in jail, accused of, or have paid fines for sexual abuse, rape, assault, theft, even murder. So which one do you think? Do you think it's the NFL and... Some are saying, yeah, we think it's NFL. Is it the NBA? Is it baseball? Is it hockey? And you know what the answer was? The United States Congress. More than the NFL? More than all these things? Because those are on the news, right? But we observe even in our nation's highest leaders, they know how to take bribes. How many are on, right now under trial for that very thing? They use their office to advance themselves, not the interests of this country and their constituents. So we see that mentality in the world today. From the highest leaders all the way down to the simplest person. You, you can go to a, to a school, even an elementary school, and you'll find kids doing deals. In the, we used to do it with chewing gum back when we were in school. You know, you buy a pack of gum for so many cents, you, you sell a stick at 10 cents a piece. You made two, 250, 300% profit by the time, and you just keep, you know, every day. Nowadays, they probably do it with drugs and other things, but that's the mentality. From, from childhood, all, they know how to advance their own cause. You don't have to teach man to do this. Now, 
What are the principles for godly stewardship? See, he's addressing his disciples for a reason, and he wants to teach them something, and he gives them a very shocking parable, humanly speaking. So what are the four principles? Look at verse 9. The first principle is you invest the temporal in the eternal. Again, it, it, verse 9, it sounds very strange. But if we examine it for what it says, I think it's clear. It says, and I say unto you. Now, we're no longer in the parable. Now he's directing, okay, I'm applying the parable to you disciples right now. And through this, he's applying it to you and me because we are disciples of Jesus Christ. We're followers of Christ. So he's saying, I'm saying to you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. I don't know about you, but when I first read that, it, says, it sounded to me like he's saying, use your possessions and your money to buy friends. Is that what it sounds like to you? You use this mammon of unrighteousness to make friends. What in the world could he mean by that? Well, it's, it, I think it's pretty clear. You take what God has entrusted to you on this earth, none of it can you take to heaven with you. Not one thing. Not even the clothes on your body, not the money in your bank account, not even the status and reputation and position that you held here on this earth. Your fame and your popularity will not go with you beyond the grave. Amen. Amen. Not a bit of it will go with you. When you stand before the Lord, you will stand only in the righteousness of Jesus Christ or the lack thereof. And you will be judged for that. So what is, it, what is Jesus telling his disciples? He's saying, look, we have seen the Pharisees and scribes seeking for their own advancement. These are the religious leaders of Israel. We see the publicans and the sinners. Oh, they certainly were advancing their causes and their desires. He said, but you are followers of Christ. You are disciples of Christ. You take the temporal things that God entrusts, however little, however much, you invest it in the eternal. What kind of friends are we supposed to make? Look carefully at this. He says, that when ye fail. In other words, when you're done, when, when, when you're, and the idea here is when you die. So Some think it means it's talking about the money, when the money runs out. But I don't think that's the case because of the next phrase. So that when you die or you fail, they may, these friends may receive you into what? Everlasting habitations. Now think about this for a moment. Where on this earth can we find an everlasting habitation? You can. Sin and the curse of sin corrupts everything from the human body to the human life to the world around us. Everything dies, everything corrodes, everything rusts, everything rots. Why? The curse of sin. So there's, I don't care how well you build your home here. It is not an everlasting habitation. Even if you could build one that lasts forever, you're not going to last forever, so it will not be your habitation for an everlasting time. So it can only be referring to heaven. You use what God entrusts you here to build your friends there in glory. You build with the temporal things that are eternal in glory. So you take what God has entrusted to you and you invest it in that which has eternal value. And folks, that's, that's a big deal. We've all known situations and people that have worked their entire lives, they've invested, they have saved. We have, okay, we're not taking vacations, we're not doing this, we're not doing that. Times are difficult, but we are maintaining our retirement so that when we retire, those last years were going to be comfortable. And how many people, dear friends, family members, just before retirement or just right after they retire. They're diagnosed with a terminal illness or they die unexpectedly. Never enjoying all that for which they worked and strove to save through that lifetime. That, it's such a sad thing. But if as the stewards of Jesus Christ, we are taking what he entrusts to us and we're investing it, investing it forward into things that have eternal value. Guess what's going to be waiting for us when we step into glory? Those friends who came to know the Lord through that investment. 
and all the rewards that we and they, they will be there for us to rejoice over for all eternity. I was talking with Casey. That's the dear friend of Maria Angelica who was by her side most of this time. They live in different towns, but they were in Bible school together, and they were, they were mischievous when they were in Bible school. I told you some of the stories how they'd put pepper in, the cho- in my chocolate bar with a syringe. They put it in my coffee or my or birthday cake. I'm talking about hot, hot pepper, much hotter than Tabasco sauce. I don't know why they would do that to me, Brother Lloyd. But I was telling Casey, I said, you know, that our, the doctors already said there's nothing more we can do. We're just going to keep her comfortable. And Casey was she was sitting there by her side at the hospital. We were texting, and I said, you know, I said. One thing about heaven, I said, I don't have to worry when she meets me with a cup of coffee when I get there, it won't have pepper in it. And Casey wrote back and said, yeah, there is that. <laughs> so, but can you imagine those people from this church, Brother Dusty, when we see him in glory and others? But you know, one of the, some of the most precious faces you will ever see are those that you led to Christ. Those that you had a part in bringing to the Savior, whether they get there first or whether you get there first, there will be that reunion there. My grandmother, she was 95, 95 at the time. Maybe it was a little bit earlier than that. We were talking about this around age 90. I was commending her for how well she was doing at that age. And, and she said, you know, Kenneth says, I'm worried says, I I don't want to do any more treatments. I don't want to go to any more doctors. I want to go to heaven. I said, what's your hurry to get to heaven? She said, well, everybody I know has already gone. And I'm afraid they're up there thinking that I didn't make it and I went to the the other place. (laughs) I said, you don't need to worry about that, Grandma. You'll be okay. Time's not passing there the way it is here. So you're okay. But imagine those that will meet us there. Invest the temporal in that which is eternal. And that, folks, will change our attitude towards our possessions on this earth. And it should. I had a great aunt and uncle. They growing up, we stayed at their home one time. Mom and dad were traveling and and we got there and we asked them, said, where's the TV? He said, well, we don't have one. You don't have a TV? No. They listened to WHPE, BBN radio, and most of the time, they're out working. And we said, well, well, don't you ever want to watch the news? Or someone says, well, you know, to, to have cable, we would have to, at that time, $25 a month. <laughs> Imagine what it would be today. But it says, the way we figure, we can support a missionary for that. We can give that money to the Lord for missions. And that, I, I, I was probably 12 or 13 years old when I heard that, and I've never forgotten it. If only we had that mentality on things that we enjoy here, but things that we start thinking more heavenly minded about some of that, how would that change our investment? Principle number one for godly stewardship is invest the temporal in the eternal. The second principle is there in verse 10, faithfully manage the least of matters. Look there at verse 10, it says, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful in much. And he that is unjust or unfaithful in the least is unjust in the much. That's pretty self, self-explanatory, self isn't it? Keith Dormer, he was the treasurer for Baptist Equipping Nationals, and he and I, as we would sit down to do, every six months we'd sit down and go through that mo- the modules that just completed, the three in the spring, then the three in the fall. Because you're talking, that is the bulk of all the expense for the whole year for Baptist Equipping Nationals is in those sets of modules. And between that and the support that came in for missions and the support for different things, you were talking about a half a million dollars a year were coming through those accounts. And he's an engineer. He's not an accountant by trade. And an engineer, it's got to be precise. It has to be exact down to the minimal details. Well, we were sitting there, and we brought everything in. We sat down. We went through everything, went through all the receipts, through my reports, and everything came out to the penny. 
And then he would go and put those into QuickBooks, which is the computer software, which I didn't fully understand, and he just worked his way as hard as he could to get through it and understand it. But there was one time we were down, and there was a $13 discrepancy. I thought we were done, ready to send the report in. And, and uh, Keith called me two days later and says, I haven't been able to sleep. Said the, the the books aren't they're not right. I said, well, what's going? On? I thought there's thousands of dollars somewhere, and we've got to find where the typo or whatever it is. And he says thirteen dollars. I said, Keith, take it out of my account and put it in there. I don't care. We're not going to spend hours looking for. He said it must be right. So when the when the accountants came to review our books. They came in and he was, they, he was asking them, could you help me find these? They said, Keith, we don't look for $13. We write off a correction and we move on. Most companies, 5 to 10% is within tolerance. And here was a man, because it was the ministry and it was the work of the Lord and the money of the Lord, he wanted to find out where those $13 were. And he grieved him when they did that correction. And, and I told him, take it from my account, put it there, it'll be an offering. But don't waste your time and stress over this. Because when he agreed to take that position, he agreed to manage a checkbook at the time. Not all these different accounts and the complexities of that accounting system. But here's a man that I never worried about. What's he doing with the money of the ministry? Because he was faithful in the least. That is how God wants us to be. You know, sometimes they think, well, I go to church and I do this and I do that. You know, I, I'm, I'm checking off the major boxes in my Christian life. And this was convicting for me. He wants us to check off those little least boxes as well. And you find somebody who's faithful in the least things, they'll be faithful in the much. Principle number three. There's more there. We've got to run. Verse 11, if therefore ye have been, been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, if ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you, to your trust, the true riches? Principle number three is faithfully manage temporal matters to be entrusted with eternal matters. Some people say, well, you know, I want to serve the Lord, but I, I want to do the big jobs. You know, make me the administrator of something. Make me the director of something. Make me, you know, in the business world, secular world, I was somebody. And if I'm going to come in to serve the Lord, I want to be somebody. You want to be somebody? Start with the small temporal matters. Be faithful in those. Serve the Lord in those. And in due time, he will put you where he wants you to be and where he gifted you to be. Be faithful in those temporal things. As, as insignificant as they may seem. Now I'm going to tell you something, that young lady, Maria. As two days ago, the, was, they were beginning to, to despair, so to speak, as they heard the news. And as so I wrote on the group, I haven't written much on the group text that's been going out to bring the updates. But I said, you know, we've been praying 24 hours a day on this prayer chain that God would cure her. And I said, God's answering that prayer, but not the way that I had prayed. I want to see him raise her up and heal her from the cancer, but he's going to simply take her home. He's answering the prayer in a way that we could not find or ask for, far better for her than anything we could come up with. But that young lady, while she was on this earth, the, the group started, sit, at that point they stopped crying about it so much, and they started reminiscing. And one would send a photo, and another would send a photo. And, another. and all of these are my idea, but they were all involved in ministry, construction, remodeling of churches, camps, VBS, Sunday school, choir, and all these, over the years, how she had been faithful in service of the Lord. And they were testifying how whenever they came to church, she was there. She was the last to leave when it was time to clean the church. You know, she, she knew how to be faithful over those temporal things. And she began to impact lives spiritually. Now somehow she finished her course in half the time the rest of us did. And the Lord took her home. But faithfully managed those temporal things. 
And fourthly, manage, faithfully manage the things of others. Verse 12, he says, And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? If, if this steward couldn't be faithful with his Lord's stuff, who's going to entrust him over other things? He's not going to find that job somewhere else. Now, for you say, how does that apply to you and I? Well, who does the money in our bank account belong to? Who does the home we live in belong to? No, it's not the bank where the mortgage is. It's the Lord's. The car that we drive, who does it belong to? To the Lord. Everything we have, everything we are, everything we ever hope to be, if we're a disciple of Christ, it's his. And we are nothing but stewards over it. So we cannot become too possessive of it. And folks, this includes our children and grandchildren. They are not ours. They are the Lord's. And we are stewards. If we cannot manage what God has entrusted to us that belongs to him, if we can't faithfully do that, how do we expect him to ever entrust to us true riches? True riches there in, back in verse 11, that's that which has truly true value, which truly matters, which is what we really want to be involved in. He says, well, you have to first manage well what belongs to him before he's going to give anything of your own. That's, that's, that's amazing. I've asked the Lord, Lord, we're trying to do the ministry here. Why don't you drop a million dollars on us? We need it. We'll use it for the ministry. And he's up there saying, well, maybe you're not managing well what I've already given you. Maybe I know you better than you do and what you will do if I give that to you. He knows who he can entrust it to and who he can't. But you want him to entrust that which truly matters? Then you be faithful over the things that he has already entrusted to you that belong to him. So we close with the overarching principle there in verse 13. It says, no servant can serve two masters. No servant. And the, the word servant here is not steward. This is a servant who lives in the household, who serves his Lord and serves his master. It says you cannot serve two masters. For, and look at the contrast here between love and hate. You'll love the one, hate the one, and love the other. Or you'll hold to the one and despise the other. Remember what I told you in scripture? Love is to accept, hold on to. Hate is to reject or despise as we see here. So notice Notice the contrast. You cannot serve God and material possessions. You cannot serve God in riches. You cannot serve God and money. So you've got to be a steward over his things. Four principles. Invest the temporal in the eternal. Faithfully manage the least of matters so that you can be faithful over the much. Faithfully manage temporal matters to be entrusted with eternal matters. And fourthly, faithfully manage the things of others. Go back sometime and read Matthew 6. It's there on the other side of the handout. Uh, 6, 19 to 34. This goes back to his inaugural address, back to the Sermon on the Mount, remember? He, took, he gave us all these principles back there. Now he's expanding upon them and telling us more about them. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this clear, if not rather shocking to us, presentation of this parable. Lord, help us to contrast our lives, our service, our stewardship with that of the world around us. May it not appear to be as they do, seeking our advancement, our purposes, our desires. But Lord, may we faithfully manage that which is yours, that you've entrusted to us, investing the temporal into the eternal, that when we get to heaven, we might hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Apply your word where it needs to be applied in each of our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.